welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you so much for being here with us in the room. For those of you here, thank you for joining us online with our online family as well. We're really glad that you're a part of the service today. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel like I've been at church today already. Man, what a wonderful time in our worship and singing and and all that was just wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, all your participation. If we keep getting better, we're going to have to get some, some buses and go on tour. That's all I'm saying. Uh, But you guys do a great job. Thank you so much. Well, today we're going to continue this series talking about how that we want to live an authentic, real faith. We don't want to be fake. We want to be real. And so today I want to talk to you about a very, very important topic. And I want to talk to you about a church's greatest need. A church's greatest need. Now, we're in this uh, time that we're uh, raising money to buy property and move and and that's an important thing for sure. And we're doing this so that we can fulfill our mission to bring people uh, into a, ra- a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, reaching people wherever they are. And so we're doing this for that reason alone, so that we can have more resources to put in ministry and we can reach more people. But understand something, that is not our greatest need. We may have needs for volunteers, Churches that are growing, churches that are reaching people will always have need for more volunteers, but that is not our greatest need. Our greatest need is not more visibility in the community, and that's always a good thing when you're lifting Jesus and you're pointing people to the cross. Having visibility in the community is a wonderful thing, but that is not our greatest need. We're going to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 today and find out what The Apostle Paul wrote to us nearly 2,000 years ago, and he said, this is the greatest need that a church has. Um, I believe that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is perhaps one of the greatest chapters in all of the Bible. Scholars have called it one of the greatest pieces of literature in human history. And I really do believe it is just take away the fact that it's Holy Scripture, take away the fact that it's inspired by God. This is one of the greatest pieces of literature in human history. 1 Corinthians 13 has been called the love chapter. And unsurprisingly, it has been used at weddings uh, to instruct us how to behave in marriage. I've used it at weddings before. But I want you to understand that in the context, Paul's not talking about your marriage. Now, it's a great application. You should follow it and be a loving spouse by doing what he said in this chapter, but that's not the main point he was making. The main point he was making you find in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we read about the importance of spiritual gifts. And what we learn from that is that everybody has something that you bring to the table. Everybody is important. You have a job to do in the church. What God has given you as a gift, he expects you to use for him. And you may not feel like that you have a lot to offer, but God says you do. That every part of the body is very, very important. And so we learn about spiritual gifts and how that everybody together make the body and the church church function properly and how important that really is. And in chapter 14, the chapter right after 1 Corinthians 13... We find about the proper use of the gifts. And right in the middle of this important discussion, the Apostle Paul drops an atomic bomb. One of the greatest things ever written, one of the greatest pieces of literature ever written, and I believe one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. And what he says is this. It's interesting. He says in the middle of talking about giftedness and calling and the importance of uh, sharing the faith with others that don't know Christ, in the middle of all of this, he says there is one thing that you got to have. He said it doesn't matter how gifted you are, how faithful you are, how orthodox you are, if you don't have love. Love is the thing. Love is the most important thing. And we've seen this proven over and over throughout church history. How many churches or Christian organizations have claimed to have truth, but they wield it like a hammer? They don't act in Christian love. They don't act with godly love, and they simply just point out to people their shortcomings while failing to recognize their own. 
And so we see that when a uh, church will take truth and wield it like a hammer, that is completely ineffective. And in fact, God said through the Apostle Paul that the results of that kind of action and behavior and activity are disastrous. And we see that many times uh, churches or organizations that have uh, taken this approach, that it's not a help to the gospel, but it's a hindrance to the gospel. So love is the thing. Love is the key to a properly functioning church. The most important need that we have as a church is love. It's the key to ministry. It's the key to evangelism. And it's the key to our relationship with God. Without question, love is the thing. John the Apostle wrote in the book of 1 John, the letter that he wrote, he said that God is love. Not just that God has love, not just that God is loving, but God is love. Don't you find it interesting that the Bible tells us that God has anger? He has to have anger to judge sin. And he judged it on the cross through his son, Jesus Christ. But God is not anger. He may have that, but he is, he not just, he's not just loving, he is love, the very personification of it. It's who he is. And so to please God and uh, to relate properly to people, we must have love. Now, the interesting thing is this, that when you have this kind of love, that it changes your behavior. It changes your attitude. It changes how you act and how you talk and how you spend your time. And how you spend your money. Have you ever noticed that? Anybody ever fall in love before? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, there's no people in love in here? Oh my God, we need to start preaching about marriage in this uh, place. Let me ask that question again and pretend like you were awake the first time that I ask it. Uh, how many have ever been in love before? There we go. God bless you for telling the truth. All right. But have you ever noticed how it changes your behavior? I remember the first time that I was in love. She had dark curly hair piercing eyes, cute little dimples, and no front teeth. And no, I'm not talking about a woman from Alabama, all right? I'm talking about Annette. That was her name. And we were in third grade. Oh, it was love. I, I, the reason I know it was love, because to express my love, I bought us both a popsicle at recess. I don't even know if kids have recess anymore at school, but if they don't, they should. Uh, I had saved my allowance. I don't know how long it took me, but a long time. And I'd traded in $2 in change, and I had a wallet. I don't know why I had a wallet in third grade, but I had to carry those two crisp $1 bills. And I was so proud of that. I would take it out and show it to people uh, in my third grade class. And of course, I broke one of those $1 bills and bought her a popsicle, and it cost 15 cents. Sadly, our love was not meant to be. She misunderstand, misunderstood my loving intentions when I pulled her hair and ran, all right? Um, and she chased me down and kicked me in the shins. And so uh, she and I knew that it wasn't for the best. It wasn't meant to be. And I knew that I could not afford that woman, all right? So, but have you ever noticed that love really changes your behavior, changes your attitude, changes how you act? your outlook in life, it changes everything about you. So I want to read to you today from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about this one thing that the church cannot do without. So we'll pick up reading in verse number one. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. How many churches are just filled with hot air? There's no substance to what they say. There's no love behind their words. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all that I have and I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Then he goes into describing the loving actions that 
he wants a church to have and individual Christians to have. Love is patient and kind. Anybody get impatient on the way to church today? I have done that many times. There was a car in front of me one time, been a while back, and they were really bothering me. They were going so slow. And I had great temptation to pull around them and cut them off and pass in a no passing zone and give them a gesture as I passed them on the way to preaching God's word at church. I'm so glad that I did not because they pulled into the parking lot and came into the church building. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, and by the way, if you're wondering what that is, it's Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes again, the perfect, that's who he is, when he comes again, then all of this partial stuff will be done away. There won't be any more need for preaching or prophecy. Why? Because we're going to be in the presence of Jesus. There won't be any more need for prayer. Why? Because we'll just talk right to him face to face. A lot of these things that God gives to the church as gifts, there will be no longer any need for them. Why? Because when the perfect comes, when Jesus Christ comes again, when we're able to see him for the first time, then we'll know. You ever wondered about things? You ever had questions about things? You ever want to ask God some things? Well, he said, now we know in part and we prophesy in part, but then when the perfect comes, the partial is going to pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly. In other words, we don't have full knowledge now. We don't understand everything now. We know that God is in control. We know that God is sovereign. We know that he loves us, that he never makes a mistake, that even the bad things in our life, the Bible says, work out for the good. They're not good things, but they work out for the good for those who love him. We see it's like looking at a dim glass. We can't see fully. We can't comprehend fully, but... Then, face to face, face to face. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to my first face to face with Jesus. Face to face. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to uh, wonder what he's thinking. I don't have to wonder what he's like, but it'll be face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully those who have suffered in life, then that would be all of us. For those that have had doubts in life, for those that have had pain, for those that have wondered why, then you're going to know. Then you'll know fully. You won't wonder, you won't have your faith shaken, but you'll know. You'll know. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. English is somewhat limited of a language. For, I'll just give you an example. Uh, we use the word love for things that really don't go together. We'll say, I love my wife or I love my husband, and you should. That is a deep love. You say, I love my child from the moment she was born. From the moment he was born, I have loved him or I've loved her fully. That is a wonderful love. But we'll also say things like, boy, I love this pizza. 
Not the same thing, really. Or I love the Bulldogs. I thought I'd get an amen right there because I don't like the Bulldogs. I, I'm a big Tar Heel fan myself, but nevertheless, maybe we have a bunch of Georgia Tech fans in here. Okay, so I love the Yellow Jackets, all right? Anybody? My God, you guys are dead today. What in the world? I want you to reach out to the person next to you and do one of two things. Either pinch them or tickle them. All right, so one or the other. And I see some of you do it. Some of you still, you haven't responded. I'm giving up. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and preach. And uh, if you listen, fine. And when I dismiss and you don't leave, I'll know that you haven't listened to a thing I've said all day. Well, the kind of love that Paul writes about here is a very distinct love. It's not like uh, English. We'll use the word love for talking about pizza or our child. But rather, there are four different words that are used mainly for the word love in the Greek language. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. And the word eros means romantic or sexual love. That would be the kind of word you would use to describe a married couple. It's romantic. Uh, it's sexual in nature. Uh, storge is the kind of love that a parent would have for a child or a husband for a wife or a family member for another family member. That is an important kind of love. Phileo is the love of a friend. It's a friendship kind of love. Uh, some of you say that you've had a friend that you've had a strong bond with, and that would be phileo. You've had that kind of love, that kind of relationship, and it's a wonderful kind of love. But the greatest kind of love, and the kind that is used here, the word love in this chapter is, uh, the Greek word is agape, agape. The word agape means an unconditional love. It is not based in emotion, but the will. You see, for the emotions can trick us. The emotions, I can be angry with someone. With the emotions, I may not feel like doing loving actions, but agape is a free gift. It is not based on the merit of the recipient, but on the choice of the giver. It is the kind of love that God has for us, and it comes from the Spirit of God. It is a fruit of the Spirit. And God tells us in Galatians chapter 5 that every believer, because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is in you, that every believer has this kind of love in them. Now, you may not be acting like it. You may not be acting on it. In fact, you may be acting the opposite, but you have access to that love and you have that kind of love because it is supernaturally inspired by the Spirit of God and it is unconditional and it is not based on feelings or circumstances. Now, as a side note, just an interesting thought. In Ephesians chapter 5, God talks about married couples and how they are to love one another. And the Bible says... Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. You want to guess which word he used there? It is the verb form of agape, agapao. He says, husbands, use agape love for your wives. Unconditional. Not based on her actions. Not based on her response. Not based on how you feel. But rather unconditional like the love of God for us. Dr. Haddon Robinson, a famous preacher of times past, said this, love is that thing which, if a church has it, it doesn't really need much else. And if it doesn't have it, whatever else it has doesn't really matter very much. The greatest need that you and I have in church and in our individual lives is the kind of love that God describes here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to give you just three quick thoughts, and we'll be done. If you're going to have this kind of love, you must prioritize love over performance. You see, in the first three verses, he talked about that. He said, it doesn't matter how talented you are, how gifted you are, how orthodox you are. If you don't have love, you're wasting your time. It doesn't matter. He tells us that love is more important than talent. How many talented Christians have I known? How many times in my own life have I depended on my own talent rather than having the love of God? Love is the thing. I am to love the way God loves me. Love is more important than talent. Love is more important than position. You might have a big position or a fancy title. 
oh, I've got a position. I'm the pastor of this church, and I'm glad that I am. I feel that God has blessed, blessed me with this. It is a wonderful, wonderful gift in my life to be able to pastor this church. But you know what? It does not matter what my position is or what your position is. If I don't have love and you don't have love, he said it's a waste of time. Ministry without love is powerless. You ever wondered why some churches seem to be able to make an impact and others don't? I I believe in organization. I believe in leadership. But you know, those are not the keys to a great church. The key to a great church is love. Because without it, ministry is powerless. It's toothless. It has no power at all. Love is the setting where life change happens. And I want you to understand that my goal as the pastor of this church, and always has been, that we operate what it says in John chapter 1. It says that the law came through Moses. That is the list of rules, the the keeping all the checkpoints, making sure that I do this and I don't do that. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You see, you and I must have truth. We must build our ministry. We must build our life on the truth, the solid foundation of the Word of God. But if there is not the grace of God to go along with it, if there is not the love of God to go along with it, it is a waste of time. I'm going to tell you a story about a woman that gave her life to Christ in our church. She's not here today. She uh, moved away. And I'm not going to share her name for some obvious reasons as I tell this story. But the first time I met her, she was here. Uh, She came uh, with her lesbian lover. And they sat in our audience, and I could tell that she was completely uncomfortable. In fact, she had that look on her face that says, I hate you, don't speak to me at all. And I did speak to her, and she was just kind of like, uh, uh, responding kind of like y'all were responding to my message a moment ago. So you don't know which one of you I'm talking about in this room today. So, But no, the fact is, uh, she had walls up, as do many people when they come for the first time. God began to change her life. And I'm so glad that our vision statement is bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ because over the years, God has brought people here from all walks of life. And they've been in many different places. Some have been atheists and got saved. Some have been religious, but they were lost and they gave their life to Christ. Some have been people in the adult entertainment industry and they gave their life to Jesus Christ. Some have been convicts. In fact, I've got to tell you this story. One of my dear friends, his name is Brad White. Uh, he pastors a church in Florida. His dad was named Richard White and I was in his church uh, back when I was in college. Kim and I went to his church. We ministered there. And uh, when he was young in the ministry, God opened a door for him uh, to go in and do services in the prison, uh, wherever he was there in Louisiana. And so his first time, he was a one-man show. He was going to lead the music. He didn't really have any announcements to make because what are they going to do in prison, right? Uh, And so he was going to preach the message and give the empty. He's doing it all. He's doing it all. And he said that he was... He was so Baptist. He was so used to what Baptist church is. If you've ever been to a Baptist church, you know that typically they'll sing a verse and then they'll sometimes sing the second verse, but they'll skip the third verse, the loneliest verse in all the Baptist hymn book, and then they'll do the fourth verse. And uh, sometimes they will do things like, uh, now all the women sing on the second verse, or all the men sing on the the second verse. So he's in prison, and he just had his Baptist habits, and he's like, you know, he's leading them. I think the song was Amazing Grace, and he's leading all these convicts, all these prisoners that were being held captive, and he's like, you know, all right, all the murderers on the second verse, and true story. Well, thank God that we have seen people come to Christ from all walks of life, addicts, racists, hypocrites, murderers, thieves, people with sexual sins, and there have been so many that have given their life to Jesus Christ. And the reason, there's only one reason, is not because we're so awesome. I believe we've got some awesome people. I believe you're awesome. But it's not because of our music. I think our music is incredible. But it's because that we have grace and truth grace and truth. Well, back to my story, Uh, this woman, she began to come 
she gave her life to Christ. She began to serve. She began to give. She began to attend a small group. Um, and one day, and, and her lesbian lover had left her. She was so faithful to this church. And I'll never forget the day that I walked up to her and I looked at her. I said, I'm so proud of you. And I love you so much. She did what I'm doing right now. She started crying. And I just watched her life as she grew spiritually. She began to serve God with her life. And she ended up moving away. And after she had been gone for several months, she reached out to me. She asked me, she said, I've visited numerous churches. And she said, I, I can't find a church like Avalon. Why can I not find a church like Avalon? And I called her name and I said, the fact is, what you found here is what every church should be, grace and truth. I said, the fact is, I never shied away from saying the truth about not just your sin, but everyone's sin. I, I never shied away from teaching the word of God and the truth of what the Bible says about anyone's sin. And we never elevate one sin above another because I find that people that do that, they don't tend to elevate their own sin. And I said, but what you also found was grace. Grace and truth. You see, it's not loving not to preach the truth, but it's even less loving to preach truth without love. So what do we do? We prioritize love over performance. Number two, you got to recognize that loving actions trump emotions. You know, I found that it's awful easy to have loving emotions. James, the half-brother of Jesus, talked about that. He said, what good is it to tell someone that is hungry or cold, oh, be warmed and fed? He said, that doesn't do any good. He said, you got to put actions behind your words. It's one thing to have empathy. It's one thing to have loving emotions, but it's a completely different thing to have loving actions. Let's just read again quickly. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. By the way, he's talking about in the context of a church. You ever brag not on others, that's wonderful to do. You ever just brag on yourself? You, you ever been around the one-uppers? You cannot tell a story unless they one-up you. Now, and I love my grandmother. Uh, she's passed away. She's in heaven now. She got saved at 70 years old, but before that, she was a terrible, terrible human being. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sugarcoating it. Everybody knew it. She was self-righteous. She thought she was better than everyone else, and she was a one-upper. And my dad was going to play a trick on her one day. And uh, he said, you know, mama, he said, my, my prostate's been bothering me. She goes, yeah, mine too. Mine's bothering me really, really bad. She didn't even realize she didn't have a prostate. So <laughs> love isn't arrogant or rude. I struggle with that one. My mom, wonderful Christian woman, um, very influential in bringing my dad to Christ, very influential in my own life for good. She taught me many, many things. She really gave me confidence. But along with that, there also came a little bit of a spirit of arrogance or being rude. I fe you ever been somewhere and somebody's supposed to be doing something and you just get real rude with them? My mom, once again, wonderful Christian woman. But uh, she would go to Lowe's or Home Depot and she knew more than everyone in the store. She had never built even a doghouse in her life. But she knew everything about every product in that store. And she would ask somebody for something. And uh, she didn't get the answer she was looking for. She would correct them. And uh, she even realized that eventually whenever they saw her, they began to turn and run. You know what the Bible says about Christian love? It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love 
bears all things. Can you bear up under love? Can you bear up under pressure? Can you bear the actions of others? Love believes all things. Do you find yourself believing for the best in people or the worst? Do you find yourself believing that with God's help, others can do good things for him? Or do you just simply believe, well, they're all, you know, they're all terrible around here. Love hopes all things and endures all things. Final thing, and we're done. We must accept that love is necessary for spiritual maturity. Paul wrote, he said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. You want to be spiritually mature? Yeah, you need to read the Bible, and I hope you'll serve and give. Those are all marks of spiritual maturity. I hope you'll grow. I hope you'll make uh, wonderful friendships and develop relationships here at this church. But I've got to tell you something. If you want to be spiritually mature, let your life be marked by agape love. The kind of love that comes from God. The kind of love that goes against human nature. The kind of love that prioritizes action over emotion. Well, today, I wonder if you came here or you've been watching online looking for someone to love you like that. Oh, we all need love. Whether we admit it or not, we're all searching for it. And the greatest need that we have is not the food that we eat, it's not the air that we breathe, it's not the water that we drink. The greatest need that we have is a loving relationship with our Heavenly Father. The, the greatest need that we have is to be able to experience this kind of love. That's why God created you like he did. You have a God-shaped hole in your soul. You're going to try to fill it with something. And many try relationships. They'll go from one partner to the next. They don't find meaning in that. Some will try to fill it with position or power or popularity and they get to the top of the ladder and they realize they were climbing the wrong wall. Many often will look for it in accomplishment or they'll look for it in money and they begin to fill their life with things and material things and at the end of the day, material things are nice but they don't bring love. And the thing that we need the most is love. And I want you to hear me today. God loves you. I don't think you heard me. God loves you. God loves you. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it's sometimes easier to believe that God loves the world, that he loves someone else, that he loves the person next to us, that he loves our neighbor or maybe someone in our family. But when we look in the mirror, can you understand? Can you believe? Can you claim that God loves you? He loves you. He loves you. Now, that doesn't mean that we, we don't repent of our sin. That doesn't mean that we don't turn to him because it's not about your works. It's about what he has done already on the cross for us. And if you came today or if you're watching today, and what you need is that relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to understand the gospel. You can't do it on your own. God sent Jesus to become human and live a perfect life. He was God and man. And as God, he could not die. But as a human being, he could. And therefore, the God-man that was 100% God and 100% man represented the human race, died on the cross in our place, but died the death that we deserve to die. And he paid for our sins. But the good news, like Megan said earlier in the service today, was not that it ended there but that he got up out of the grave after three days to prove his love for you, to prove his love for us, to prove his love for the church. And all you got to do is receive it. All you got to do is receive it. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, understand that it's not a magical prayer that saves you, but it is the act of the heart. But you can pray something like this. Dear God, I believe Jesus is the son of God. 
and I want to receive him right now as my Savior. I admit to you that I deserve punishment. I deserve to pay for my own sins. But thank you that you paid them for me. And I want to receive you today. If you'll pray a prayer just simply like that, God promises that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you'll trust him and he'll change your life. And I'm living example, living proof, and so many others are in this room as well, of the power of the love of God. And if you want to receive Jesus today, take the card in the seat pocket in front of you, mark on there that you've prayed to receive Christ, drop it in the drop box on the way out today. Online, if you will, just make sure that you uh, click that button at the bottom of the screen that you pray to receive Christ today, and we'll follow up with you and let you know uh, just how much God really does love you. We want to help you take your next step. And maybe today you are thinking about your next step. Well, next Sunday, we're going to have the next step class. If you're new to our church and you need to go through that, uh, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, if you want to get baptized, we'll be baptizing in a couple of weeks again. Uh, if you want to get involved in a ministry or get involved in a small group, the best way to get connected is go through the next step class. But you can uh, see uh, someone uh, in, the lo- in the lobby, the front lobby here, and uh, they will help you get connected, all right? You can fill it out on a card, give it to someone, and they'll follow up with you. But I want you to know that um, I love you today. I'm so very, very thankful that you are here. And maybe today we'll end our service like this. Jesus, I need to love like you. Jesus, help me to love like you. In fact, I want us to end with that as our prayer. Would you stand together? Let's everyone, if you're willing to pray this prayer and you mean it from your heart, let's say it together. I'm going to repeat it one more time and then we're going to say it together. Jesus, help me to love like you. All right, ready? Let's say it together as a prayer to God. Jesus, help me to love like you. That's my prayer for you this week. God bless you. I love you. Have a great week. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.